right, today we're going to start looking at our first lecture on the nervous system. The nervous system is a really big system to cover, so we will have multiple videos over the nervous system and multiple chapters. The nervous system, along with your endocrine system, is going to be what helps to keep control of things in the body, what's going to maintain homeostasis, and keep everything balanced and functioning together. It's responsible for your behavior, your memories, movements, feelings, everything. The branch of medical science that deals with the nervous system is called neurology. So we've got the major structures. You've got your CNS that's going to include the brain and the spinal cord. And then the PNS is your peripheral nervous system. CNS is central. PNS would include the cranial nerves, the spinal nerves, the ganglia, the enteric plexuses that you have in the small intestine, the sensory receptors in the skin. Just some examples of what it includes. It's everything outside the spinal cord. So we have 12 pairs of cranial nerves, 31 pairs of spinal nerves. They're going to emerge from the spinal cord. Cranial nerves come from the cranium. The ganglia are outside the brain and spinal cord. They're small masses of nervous tissue. They'll primarily have the cell bodies of neurons. Your enteric plexuses are going to help to regulate the digestive system. And then our sensory receptors are either parts of neurons in specialized cells that monitor changes in the internal or the external environment. So we have the two branches, the CNS and the PNS. The PNS is divided into the somatic and autonomic. The autonomic is going to operate in one of two modes, either sympathetic or parasympathetic. It's a motor only system. So functions, we have sensory, integrative, and motor functions. Sensory is going to sense changes in the internal and external environment. It's going to use sensory receptors to do this. They're sometimes referred to as your afferent neurons. Integrative functions help to analyze that information. They'll store some aspects, but they will make decisions on what is going to be the appropriate response. So you'll have association or inner neurons to serve this function. Motor functions will respond to the stimuli. These are going to travel through efferent neurons. So it was not my idea to call them afferent and efferent. Um, I personally like using sensory and motor. They're more descriptive, but a lot of books are going to use afferent and efferent. So best to just get used to the terms. So the functional unit is the neuron. It has the capacity to produce action potentials. It's the electric signal or the electric excitability that goes with it. Your cell body will have a single nucleus with a prominent nucleolus. The nissel bodies are chromatographic substances or chr chromatophilic substances, so they'll attract pigment to them. You have the rough ER and free ribosomes for protein synthesis. The neurofilaments are going to give the cell shape and support. Microtubules move the materials inside, and lipofusion pigments will cause clumps in there. It's thought to be related to a harmless effect of aging. And then the cell processes, we have the dendrites on the receiving end and axons on the sending end. So this is a picture of one example of a motor neuron underneath the microscope. This is an artist's representation of a neuron. They clearly don't look very similar in there, but the artist's representation at least give you something to think of in your mind when you're thinking about the structure of a neuron. <clears throat> so with the cell body, you can see the cell body structure here. This is the cell body underneath a microscope. So the neurolemma is the sheath around the nerve axon. The axolemma is the cell membrane around an axon. And then the axon terminal is going to be the endings that will connect with either another nerve or an effector. The axon hillock is going to connect the cell body to the axon. Your axon collaterals are branches of the main axon. They're usually going to be used for modulation and regulation. So where it's going to communicate with something else, we call that site a synapse. And it will have a little bit of a gap between those two sites that will do the communication called the synaptic cleft. So we can't have the electric impulse jump over the gap, so instead we have to use 
a neurotransmitter, and those will be stored in synaptic vesicles that will be released into the cleft and then diffuse across the cleft to send the message. The myelin sheath is the insulating layer that's formed around the nerve, and the little spaces between the myelin are the nodes of Ranvier. The telodendria are going to be the branches of the axon that are each going to have axon terminals. So you can have different types of neurons, multipolar neurons. So here you've got multiple axon ends to it. You have the myelin sheath, the axon, the trigger zone, your dendrites, and your cell body. So the bipolar, so you've got the cell body more towards the middle here, and then the unipolar. Here it is, your cell body is off to the side. So our functional classifications, your sensory or afferent nerves are going to carry impulses towards your CNS. Most of the time they're unipolar with their cell bodies found in ganglia outside the CNS. So you can see here with the unipolar, their cell bodies are off to the side. That makes them easier to cluster them somewhere else. Motor or efferent are going to carry impulses away from the CNS to the target should be your effector muscles or glands. They're multipolar, so most of their cell bodies are going to be located within the CNS. Your association or inner neurons mostly are confined to the CNS. Almost all of them are multipolar. They'll lie between the motor and sensory neurons and will act as a CNS shuttle of the signal. So they'll carry the information between those two types of neurons. They actually make up 99% of the neurons in the body. So your presynaptic neuron is going to be the one that carries information to the synapse. The postsynaptic neuron is going to be the one receiving the information and will carry it away from the synapse. So this is a nice little functional classification of the neurons here. So where you would have receptors, the peripheral nervous system, the central nervous system, what's involved where. So looking at exon axonal transport. The cell body is the location where most of the protein synthesis will occur. So this is where you would make the neurotransmitters. Any proteins that would be used for repair are made here. The axonal transport system is going to move substances. We've got slow and fast axonal flow. Slow axonal flow is going to go in one direction only away from the cell body and it will move at one to five millimeters per day. The fast axonal flow is going to move the organelles and the materials along the surface of the microtubules. It's going to go 200 to 400 millimeters per day, and it can transport in either direction. So this is good for use of recycling in the cell body. So this again just shows you some of the different receptors that you would have on these different types of cells particularly on some of the unipolar neurons. This is showing a couple of the CNS types of neurons, Purkinje cells and pyramidal cells. They're called pyramidal because this is more pyramid shaped. So the neuroglia cells are half of the volume of the CNS. They're smaller than neurons, but there is 50 more times of them than there are neurons. These cells can divide, they can do rapid mitosis. So most of the time when there is a tumor form in the CNS, a glioma, it's gonna involve neuroglia cells because they're the ones that do the dividing. There's four cell types in the CNS, astrocytes, oligodendrocytes, microglia, and ependymal. And then there's two in the PNS, the Schwann cells and satellite cells. So you can see this is your neuron here. These are neuroglia all around it. So this is showing some examples, illustrations of these different types of cells. Mm -hmm. So your astrocytes are the star-shaped star -shaped cells. They form the blood-brain barrier by covering blood capillaries. They're going to metabolize neurotransmitters and help regulate the potassium balance. They're important for structural support. They'll guide neuron development and any repair that might happen in the neural tissue. The oligodendrocytes are the most common of the glial cells. They're going to form the myelin sheath around 
more than one of the axons in the CNS. They are similar to the Schwann cells of the PNS. They're just different named because one's in the CNS, one's in the PNS. The microglia are going to be small cells found near the blood vessels. They have more of a phagocytic role. They're going to clear away the dead cells. These are derived from the same cells that gave rise to macrophages and monocytes. Ependymal cells are going to form the epithelial membrane and lining of the cerebral vascular cavities and central canal. These are going to be the ones that are able to produce your cerebral spinal fluid. So your glial cells in the PNS are Schwann cells and satellite cells. So the Schwann cells are going to encircle the PNS axons. Each cell produces part of the myelin and that sheath is going to surround the axon in the PNS. Your satellite cells are flat cells that are going to surround the neuronal axon bodies in the peripheral ganglia. They're going to provide support to the neurons in the PNS and the ganglia. So when we look at myelinated versus unmyelinated axons, myelinated have myelin around them, unmyelinated does not. The Schwann cells myelinate the axons in the PNS during fetal development. The Schwann cell cytoplasm and nucleus forms the outermost layer of the neurolemma, with the inner portion being the myelin sheath. So the tube guides growing axons that are repairing themselves. So in the nervous system, something that is myelinated is more likely to be able to repair and repair better than something unmyelinated. So all axons surrounded by a lipid and protein covering the myelin sheath is produced by Schwann cells. The neural lemma is the cytoplasm and nucleus of the Schwann cell. And the little gaps are called the nodes of Ranvier. So myelinated fibers will appear white. It's here like a jelly roll of wrappings made up of lipoprotein makes up the myelin. It's going to act as an insulator and it speeds the conduction of nerve impulses. So we say it appears white. It's more of it's light beige versus a darker beige, but that's why we call it white matter and gray matter. So the unmyelinated fibers are slower. They're smaller diameter fibers that are only surrounded by a neurolemma, but they don't have any myelin sheath to wrap around it. So you can see the color differences for where you have the myelination in the CNS. Oligodendrocytes myelinate axons in the CNS. You've got broad, flat processes that wrap around those CNS axons, but the cell bodies do not surround the axons, so there's no neurolemma formed. Little regrowth after injury is possible because they lack a distinct tube or neurolemma. So this kind of gives a guide of the organization of the nervous system. So the CNS is your brain and spinal cord. Everything else is part of the PNS. So this is another way of looking at it, the divisions of the nervous system. If you can pick one that makes sense to you, focus on looking at that. I included multiple images in here because not every type of image clicks with everybody's brain. So when we look at the subdivisions of the PNS, the somatic or voluntary nervous system is your SNS or somatic nervous system. Here you have neurons from the cutaneous and special sensory receptors that are going to go to the CNS, and then you'll have motor neurons that will go to the skeletal muscle tissue. Your autonomic nervous system is involuntary. You've got sensory neurons that are going to go from the visceral organs to the CNS, and then motor neurons that are going to go to the smooth and cardiac muscle and glands. It's going to operate in one of two modes. The sympathetic division is your fight or flight mode. It will do things like speed up the heart rate. Parasympathetics is your rest and digest. It will slow things down. The enteric nervous system is involuntary and it's going to have sensory and motor neurons that control the gastrointestinal tract. They're going to function independently of the autonomics in the CNS. So looking at the electrical signals in neurons, neurons are electrically excitable because of the voltage membrane or the voltage difference that occurs across their membrane. They're able to communicate with two types of electric signals. 
The action potentials are ones that can travel long distances, and then the graded potentials are ones that are local membrane changes only. So in living cells, we have a flow of ions that occur through ion channels in the cell membrane. They essentially work very similar to a battery. So kind of an overview of what happens is you have an impulse that's going to start in the brain. It's going to come down the spinal cord. It's going to exit out. You'll have a motor neuron deliver that information. And then a sensory receptor is going to bring information back up through that peripheral neuron into the spinal cord and back up to the brain. So we have different types of ion channels. The leakage or non-gated ion channels are always open. Nerve cells have more potassium than sodium leakage channels. So as a result, you have your membrane permeability to potassium being higher. So this is why they have a resting membrane potential of negative 70 millivolts in nerve tissue. Ligand gated ion channels are going to open and close in response to a stimulus. This results in neuron excitability. Voltage gated ion channels respond to a direct change in the membrane voltage. Mechanically gated ion channels are going to respond to a me mechanical vibration or pressure. So closed ion channels are non-conducting and impermeable to ions. Open ion channels are able to conduct electrical current. They allow specific types of ions to pass. Inactivated ion channels have flow blocked by something other than closing the channel. So this gives you some ideas of what these different channels are like in here. So here you can see with the mechanical stimulus, it's a mechanical gate that opens up. With the ligand, you have some sort of chemical that's going to bind in there. With these leakage ones, the channel's going to open and it leaks out. And then voltage gated, so it's going to be controlled by a change in an electric stimulus. So to create this resting membrane potential, we have negative ions along the inside of the cell membrane and positive ions along the outside. So that's measured at rest at negative 70 millivolts. We say the cell is polarized. And resting potential exists because there's a concentration of ions different on the inside and outside. So extracellular fluid is rich in sodium and chloride. The cytosol is full of potassium, organic phosphate, and amino acids. So your membrane permeability will be different for the sodium and potassium. It's 500 to or 50 to 100 times greater permeability for the potassium. The inward flow of sodium cannot keep up with the outward flow of potassium. So the sodium potassium pump is going to constantly be removing the sodium as fast as it leaks in. So here you can see where this is going to create this difference of charge. Here you've got one that has equal numbers. Here you can see where they are separated and you've got this negative 70 millivolts. This is showing it with an illustration that you've got these charges separated. And these are the different types of channels going across. So you've got the leaky potassium channel, the leaky sodium channel, potassium channel, and then you've got your sodium potassium pump here that's going to constantly be pumping sodium out and potassium in. So our graded potentials are going to involve small deviations from the resting potential of negative 70 millivolt. So when something depolarizes, you decrease the membrane potential. Inside's going to become less negative. It goes closer to zero. It may actually even move above zero to become positive. With hyperpolarization, you have an increase in the membrane potential. Inside becomes more negative, and it reduces the probability of generating a nerve impulse. So signals are graded. It means they're going to vary in amplitude depending on the strength of the stimulus, and they're localized. So they're most often going to occur in the dendrites in the cell body. So here you can see if this is the mound you have to go up, when you're hyperpolarized, you're even farther away from being able to get up that mound. So this is just showing some of the graded potentials in response to opening 
mechanically gated channels or ligand gated channels. So this shows the stimulus strength and graded potentials. So what happens is the stimulus strength increases in time. And this is showing summation here, where it doesn't come down all the way, but then it starts to go up again. So if graded potentials reach a sum of about negative 55 millivolts, the threshold potential is achieved. It's made it far enough that it's actually going to send that action potential. So if you didn't get up to this point here, then it's not going to go. But as long as you get to here, it's going to finish and go all the way. So this will trigger an action potential which occurs in the axon only. So that action potential is a sequence of rapidly occurring events that are going to decrease and eventually reverse the membrane potential. So it will depolarize and then restore it back to the resting state so it will follow it with repolarization. So your voltage gated sodium and potassium channels open in sequence. They are all or none. So if you reach the threshold the action potential is going to go through, it's always going to be the same. A stronger stimulus is not going to create a larger impulse with these. So this is a different picture showing it here. Again, where you come up, if you reach that threshold, your action potential is going to occur. You've got a depolarizing and a repolarizing phase. And then immediately afterwards, it can hyperpolarize just a little bit. So this is showing the membrane potential in millivolts. So here it's not enough to reach that threshold. Here it has, and you have the action potential occur. So this is a threshold that wasn't strong enough. This one has reached the threshold. This one has reached it and gone beyond the threshold. So we have changes in the ion flow during depolarizing and repolarizing. So during the rested state, you have all the voltage-gated sodium and potassium channels closed. During the depolarizing phase, the membrane potential of the action axon is going to reach the threshold. And the gates are going to open. During the repolarizing phase, the sodium channels inactivate, the gates close, and potassium channels open. And then during the repolarization phase, your potassium outflow is going to continue and it will eventually restore the resting membrane potential. So during the depolarization phase, you have the chemical or mechanical stimulus that caused the graded potential. It's reached at least negative negative 55 millivolts are the threshold. So those voltagated sodium channels open, sodium rushes in. In the resting membrane, inactivation of the gate of the sodium channels open, the activation gate is closed, so the sodium cannot get in. It reaches the threshold of negative 55 millivolts. It is going to open and the sodium enters. The inactivation gate closes again after a few ten thousandths of a second. So it ends up that only about 20,000 sodiums actually enter the cell, but it's enough to change the membrane potential considerably up to positive 30 millivolts. So it's a positive feedback process. So during the repolarizing phase, the threshold of the potential has been reached, voltage-gated potassium channels open, the potassium channel opening is much slower, so it's going to cause the depolarization. When the potassium channels finally do open, the sodium channels have already closed. Potassium outflow is going to return the membrane potential to negative 70 millivolts. If enough leaves the cell, it will reach negative 90 millivolts and enter into the hyperpolarizing phase. So the potassium channels close, the membrane potential is going to return to the resting potential of negative 70 millivolts. <clears throat> so hyperpolarization occurs because those potassium gates remain open, causing an excessive efflux of potassium. 
the neuron is insensitive to the stimulus and depolarization during this time. So you have this little refractory period here where you can't send a stimulus when you've gone into this hyperpolarization. So the refractory period in there, you cannot generate another action potential. So even a very strong stimulus will not begin another action potential here. The inactivated sodium channels have to go back to that resting state before they can be reopened. So large fibers have an absolute refractory period of 0.4 milliseconds. So up to 1,000 impulses per second are possible. So some of these can be very fast. The relative refractory period is a super threshold stimulus will be able to start an action potential. So if there is a big enough stimulus, it can. The sodium channels are still open, but the sodium channels have closed. <coughs> so when we look at continuous versus saltatory conduction, Continuous conduction will occur in unmyelinated fibers, mm -hmm. so you've got to do step-by-step -step polarization of each portion of the length of the axolemma. With saltatory, depolarization only occurs at the nodes of Ranvier, where there's a high density of voltage-gated ion channels. So it essentially gets to skip over the myelinated portion, making it much faster. So this is showing here the time frame and how you're going to have this action potential propagate as it moves down. So here it has to go all the way down this neuron. Here it only has to go in the spaces in between. So the saltatory conduction is going to be faster. So factors that will affect the speed of propagation, how much myelin you have, the axon diameter and the temperature. The larger myelinated fibers are going to conduct impulses faster due to their size and saltatory conduction. With the fiber types, your A fibers are the largest. They're 5 to 20 microns. They'll go up to 130 meters per second. This is what you would have in myelinated somatic sensory and motor skeletal fibers. Your B fibers are medium size, 2 to 3 microns. They can go up to 15 meters per second. This would be myelinated visceral sensory and autonomic pre preganglionic neurons. And then the C fibers are the smallest. They're unmyelinated sensory and autonomic motor fibers. They are going to be 0.5 to 1.5 microns, and they'll go up to 2 meters per second. So the synapse is how you have adjacent neurons communicate with each other. So most of it is going to have one neuron in the dendrites deliver information to another one. So here you've got your axonic synapses here and your site of communication. The presynaptic neuron is going to be the information sender. The postsynaptic is the one that receives information. And neurons may have from 1,000 to 10,000 axonal terminals making synapses. So you can have one neuron talking to a lot of other ones. So there are two types of synapses. The electrical ones have an ionic current spread to the next cell through the gap junction. This is a faster two-way transmission that's capable of synchronizing groups of neurons. The chemical means is going to involve neurotransmitters. It's one-way information transfer from a presynaptic neuron to a postsynaptic neuron. So axodendritic goes from axon to dendrite. Axosomatic goes from axon to cell body. Axoaxonic goes from axon to axon. So here you can see you've got a synapse You've got your synaptic vesicles here with the neurotransmitters. They have to cross the synaptic cleft. And then you have these neurotransmitter receptors that are going to have ligand-gated ligand channels that can be opened up. 
So in chemical synapses, the action potential is going to reach the end bulb and the voltage gated calcium channel will open. Calcium is going to flow inward and trigger the release of the neurotransmitter. The neurotransmitter will cross the cleft and bind to the ligand gated receptors. The more neurotransmitter released, the greater the change in the potential of the postsynaptic cell. The synaptic delay is about 0.5 milliseconds and it involves one-way information transfer. So the effects of a neurotransmitter can either be excitatory or inhibitory. So a depolarizing postsynaptic potential is called an EPSP. It's going to result from opening of a ligand-gated sodium channel, and the postsynaptic cell is more likely to reach threshold. It's going to be excitatory because it's going to help it reach the threshold. An inhibitory postsynaptic potential is called an IPSP. It's going to result from opening of a ligand-gated chloride or potassium channel. It will cause the postsynaptic cell to become more negative or hyperpolarized. So that postsynaptic cell is less likely. It's inhibited. So this is showing some of the different types of receptors here, the ionotropic and metatropic. So to remove the neurotransmitter, it's going to move through diffusion. It's going to go down the concentration gradient. You can have enzymatic degradation. So one example would be acetylcholine esterase will break down the acetylcholine in the cleft. Or you can have uptake by neurons or glial cells. You have neurotransmitter transporters that will pull it back up. So an example of is Prozac, which is a serotonin reuptake inhibitor. It's going to prevent the serotonin from being cleaned back up out of the cleft, leaving it in the cleft longer. So there's three possible responses. You can have small EPSPs where the potential is going to reach negative 56 millivolts, not quite negative 55. You can have an impulse generated. The threshold was reached. It actually reached the membrane potential of at least negative 55 millivolts, millivolts. Or an IPSP, the membrane became hyperpolarized. It dropped below negative 70 millivolts. Summation, this is going to be if you have several presynaptic end bulbs release their neurotransmitter at the same time. The combined effect may generate a nerve impulse due to summation. So summation can be spatial or temporal. So with spatial summation, you've got the summation effects of neurotransmitters released from several end bulbs into one neuron. With temporal, the summation effects of neurotransmitters released from two or more firings of the same end bulb. So they're firing in rapid succession, spatial, multiple neurons firing. Neurotransmitters are going to carry the signal across the synaptic cleft. They can be excitatory, inhibitory. You have both types present in the CNS and the PNS. The same neurotransmitter may be excitatory in one location and inhibitory in another. Some of the more important neurotransmitters, acetylcholine, glutamate, aspartate, gamma-aminobutyric acid or GABA, glycine, norepinephrine, epinephrine, and dopamine. So this is just showing their chemical structure. Um, this is not the kind of thing that most people would memorize. It's just kind of for curiosity's sake. So neurotransmitter effects can be modified. You can have their synthesis be stimulated or inhibited. You can block or enhance their release. Their removal can be stimulated or blocked. The receptor site can be blocked or activated. So that's what a lot of pharmaceuticals are going to do is work at changing these things. An agonist is going to be anything that will enhance a transmitter's effect. An antagonist is going to block the action of a neurotransmitter. So some examples of our neurotransmitters here. Some small molecule neurotransmitters. We have acetylcholine. This is released by many of the peripheral nervous system neurons and some of the CNS. It's excitatory in the neuromuscular junction, but it is inhibitory at other places. And it's inactivated by acetylcholine esterase. Some of the amino acids, 
Glutamate's released by nearly all excitatory neurons in the brain, and it's inactivated by glutamate-specific tr transporters. GABA is an inhibitory neurotransmitter for about a third of all the brain synapses. So Valium is a GABA agonist. It's going to enhance its inhibitory effects. Serotonin, this contributes to well-being and happiness. It's mainly found in the brain, also in the bowels, blood platelets. The SSRIs or SRIs, your selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. This is one category of antidepressants that will keep the serotonin in the cleft longer to increase the effects. So neural circuits, we can have neuronal networks works that will contain thousands or even millions of neurons. They're involved in a lot of important activities like breathing, short-term memory, waking up. So a neurotransmitter is a chemical that's used for a neuron to communicate, where a neuromodulator is going to be a chemical that affects the neurotransmission of a whole group of neurons. <clears throat> so this is showing some of the different types of circuits so you can have a diverging circuit here where it goes from 1 to 2 to 4. Converging circuit where you're going to have multiple of them come together into one. A reverberating circuit where you're going to be getting some feedback. And a parallel after discharge circuit where you can have two more than one different way of getting to the same output. So we do have some plasticity maintained throughout life. We're going to sprout new dendrites. We're going to synthesize new proteins. We can change the synaptic contacts with other neurons. However, there's limited ability for regeneration or repair. So in the PNS, you can repair damaged dendrites or axons. It doesn't always mean they will, but it is possible if the damage is within a reasonable amount. In the CNS, no repairs are possible. So when there's damage to an axon, usually there's going to be changes called chromatolysis that are going to occur in the cell body of the affected cell. It's going to cause swelling of the cell body, and it peaks between 10 and 20 days after injury. You'll note this is different than if you have soft tissue injury other places in your body, like a musculoskeletal injury. By the third to fifth day, degeneration of the distal portion of the neuronal process and myelin sheath has occurred. We call it Wallerian degeneration. Afterwards, the macrophages are going to phagocytize the remains. With retrograde degeneration, the proximal portion of the fiber would degenerate. This extends only to the first neurofibril node. Regeneration then follows chromatolysis. You'll have synthesis of the RNA and protein accelerate, which is going to favor rebuilding the axon, but this can take several months. <clears throat> so here we're looking at Wallerian degeneration. The axon distal to the injury degenerates. So this is where the Schwann cells are really important. What they will do is help form a path for new growth and wrap the axon in myelin. So axons and dendrites may be repaired if the neuronal cell body remains intact, the Schwann cells remain active and can form a tube, and the scar tissue does not form too rapidly. So chromatolysis is 24 to 48 hours after injury. The nissel bodies break up into fine granular masses. So by three to five days, you have Wallerian degeneration occurring where you have breakdown of the axon and myelin sheath distal to the injury. Retrograde degeneration is going to occur back one node. So within several months, regeneration occurs. The neurolemma on each side of the injury repairs the tube. So you can have Schwann cell mitosis for this. And then the axonal buds grow down the tube to reconnect. They can move at about 1.5 millimeters per day, so it is slow. For neurogenesis in the CNS, formation of the new neurons from stem cells was not thought to occur in humans. There's a lack of neurogenesis in other regions of the brain and spinal cord. Some of the factors that would prevent neurogenesis in the CNS, you've got inhibition by neuroglial cells the absence of growth stimulating factor, lack of neurolemmas, 
and rapid formation of scar tissue.